Uh, thanks very much, Troy, and uh, thanks to everyone here today uh, for coming. Uh, I think this is a great initiative and uh, really proud to be able to support it. Um, today, what I'm just going to what I'm going to talk about is really to try and give everyone a little bit of an overview of the climate that we're all working in. Um, Bailey is a, uh, for, uh, a stockbroker and uh, financial planning business that we work for, um, so we get a bit of a view, uh, more on a higher level um, across across the world, and you know, what we're seeing in global economics, uh, local economics, uh, and down closer to the investment level. So what we're going to talk about today is pretty much a bit of that, bringing everything down from a global down to where we are today, and to try and get a bit of a view as to what some of these, uh, some of the smart money and where they might be invested and where that all lies. So I've got a nice little picture up here. That's a bit of the romance around uh, what we see in terms of agriculture. But uh, the reality and what I'm going to keep talking about today uh, in main focus um, is the agricultural land use in Australia. And I, I thought I should put this chart up because I think it, it gives us a visual of what we're, uh, what we're all thinking about and what we the actual part of the economy that, uh, that really drives drives this space that we're working in. Um, you can see the grey, uh, grazing on native vegetation takes up the majority of the country, but uh, grazing modified pastures uh, and in, uh, the uh, shaded out wheat sheep zone uh, also takes up probably, you'd, you'd suggest about 20% uh, or so of the land mass of the country. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty significant area. The next bit is our disclaimer. Obviously, uh, I like to make a bit of a joke here, but it's it's pretty real when we talk about this stuff. Um, we're going to throw up some ideas uh, through the presentation. None of this is financial advice. So, if you want to be if you want to go and act on any of this information, please make sure you see your your advisor first. So, to the uh, global economic environment. Um, also, sorry, just before I go on, um, I'm notorious for trying to jam too much into the slides. Uh, you're able to get these slides after the event. So some of you at the back might not be able to see, so I apologise for that. But um, I think it gives you an idea as to what we're, uh, what we're able to cover. Um, so, yeah, global economic environment. Um, I won't go too much into the US trade war uh, and politics. That's an ongoing thing, and I think everyone gets a fair dose of that daily. But I think what we really need to focus on is, is the Asian environment. Um, Asia's right on our doorstep and the population growth is significant. The, the chart down uh, on my right and your left, uh, the, the bars there, the dark bars, and then the dark grey bars are actually the ones you want to have a look at. Uh, the the uh, longevity of people, um, you can see the smallest bar uh, down the bottom here, I don't know if the pointer works, yeah, the, down the bottom here, India. Um, since 1915 to 2015, the actual age of people living has tripled. So from, from down here, it's about actually 25, uh, closer to 70. So it's, you're getting right up there and uh, that's a significant driver of obviously the food population that we're seeing, uh, population growth. Uh, to, to talk about China, uh, I'll skip over to the one here on our left, uh, my left, your right. Uh, the Economic growth, um, and you can see over a long, long period of time, 1982 down the bottom here, all the way up to projected to 2022. That's sort of three, three or four billion, going up to 70 billion, uh, 70 billion dollars in GDP and growth. So the numbers there are quite, uh, are quite astronomical, um, and that's all based off of that population growth that we saw. Um, and then it's obviously worth talking about China. Um, China, I'll put. Uh, the chart up there that you can see, uh, Chinese industrial production there in the blue, um, has been rocketing along in the uh, in the 2000s, and Australia's obviously been a key beneficiary of that. Uh, but what we're seeing is that slowing down significantly towards a uh, sort of a six percent level, but that is uh, significantly lower. But when your economy gets the size of China's, um, you're still adding the, the economy of South Korea to your country every year. It's quite phenomenal. So one of the other key drivers is that uh, the Chinese, uh, in terms of pollution um, and how things are looking there, what I've, tr I've tried to squeeze in this chart right in the middle there, and you can see here what this chart actually shows. This square is the whole land mass of China. Uh, then this bit here is the actual amount that they're able to produce. This bit here is the amount of land that's actually polluted. So there's about 20% 
of the landmass of China is polluted and unable to grow to grow crops. So I think that's that's an important point and uh, partly why the Chinese uh, like South Australia so much and Australia more broadly. Um, moving to the Australian economic environment, um, GDP growth, we're really uh, thinking that that's going to slow down. Um, housing supply, I was talking to some of the guys earlier and, and just sort of explaining that. I can talk to you through that later as it's not really the focus of what we're looking at here. But the secondary effects, business confidence, uh, job ads, drought, that, uh, sorry, job ads, uh, and in addition, the drought is uh, is really starting to push through, starting to cause some issues. And what we've got here is uh, Australian GDP, once again, a little bit in a, uh, aligned with China, starting to slow down. Um, and the farm farm GDP, this is uh, real numbers. It's had the 20% year on year fall hasn't really hit here yet in the numbers, but that's coming through with some of the disasters that we've seen of recent. There's some of the key agricultural indicators, and I won't go on too much about this, you can uh, come back to it, but the Australian dollar is obviously key. When commodity prices are, are strong, you start to see, uh, you, you see the Aussie dollar go up. Uh, when the commodity prices are poor, the Aussie dollar will tend to go down. One of the other key indicators and one of the uh, parts we think are really important in terms of um, uh, competitiveness is uh, the productivity. And the red, oops, wrong one. the red line here, you can see productivity is really dropping off. And that's because of all our cost inputs, being electricity, gas, et cetera. Uh, and that's uh, shown here down on the bottom chart. I'll let you have a look at that when you have a look at the slides at, at a later time. So just moving on, obviously climate risk uh, does appear to be increasing. It's not uh, not brain surgery and I'm not pointing, uh, pointing out anything that people don't really know. Um, the floods, the Gulf floods in Queensland were, were quite, quite incredible and potentially there's 300,000 uh, head of cattle that was lost. Uh, New South Wales drought and fish kill made the news pretty recently. But what hasn't, what really hasn't made the news is, is some of this information here, and it's a little bit, a little bit hard to see up the back. But the areas, uh, climate, the impact of climate change on uh, farm cash incomes. So the, there's been a survey done from 1950 to 2019 on on incomes, and what we're seeing is that um, I, from from 2000 onwards, there's been a significant decline because of climate change in in uh, the south. Southwest of WA and middle of New South Wales and Victoria, so we think that's a that's a pretty key uh, key stat because it's those when we're looking to go and invest in businesses, it's those businesses that can handle uh, firstly water security and that climate change issue. So it's easy to to go on about the bad bits uh, of agriculture because everyone has to face that uh, on a on a daily and yearly monthly yearly basis. But really the drivers of agricultural production and while we've I mentioned productivity before, despite those cost input pressures, the productivity um, of, of agribusiness is, is really quite good relative to a lot of different industries. Um, all the industries here across the bottom um, and agriculture at the end um, on an average basis is 46% more productive than, than the average. So we think that's pretty good. Over, over the last... Um, Sort of since 19, 1998, um, production and value, production of price um, of a long, over a long period of time uh, has been increasing significantly. So since I think that's 1998, all the way up to a current level, uh, we've gone from 10 billion up to 30 billion uh, just in crops and very similar uh, in livestock. So we think the production numbers are there um, and is projected uh, from ABARE to continue to rise. Just going back to the productivity, I think this is a, once again, you'll be able to see this if you have a look at the charts later. Um, what we've done here is to have a look at farm structure and productivity. And what we can see, this is from 1979, all these, these charts here uh, on your left. It's in 1979 through to 2017-18. The middle, the middle bar is, sorry, the top dark bar is what we're looking at. So this is population share. Farms with receipts greater than a uh, million dollars, population share was relatively low. Uh, it's probably increased by, in percentage terms, uh, to about 20%. But then you can see the income shares, land share, and output value shares 
of that farms with greater than one million really sort of shows that the, the productivity is really moving through the whole agricultural sector. So just just quickly, and I won't I won't go into this uh, in too much depth, but um, who's investing in agriculture? Um, China, obviously, they're they're trying to get the money out of the uh, the Chinese system, and to try and get that into places that are that are safe, secure, uh, and able to provide provide for them if they want to export that back to China. China has been growing at twenty two percent, but it's uh, in overall terms, absolute numbers, it's still well well behind the US. Japan and the UK. And you can see that uh, the uh, Foreign Investment Review Board, that's FERB, um, approvals by country. Uh, China has been significant. Canada, the United States uh, are the main investors. Canada has a large pension plan. They've got a little bit like us, significant superannuation um, savings and pensions that they need to need to look out for, uh, need to provide for. Um, so they do that through partially investing in agriculture in Australia. And then the Chinese investment stock, uh, 2010 was only sort of 12 billion. That's risen up to 35 billion uh, by 2017, which is pretty phenomenal. <coughs> the other bit, and this gets talked about a lot, so we try to bring some um, bring some hard numbers to where, where things are at. People like to sort of emotionalize the uh, proportion of agricultural land ownership. Um, and I won't talk about Australia, too much, but other other than to say, Northern Territory is sort of thirty percent, which is which is pretty pretty amazing. Um, South Australia, importantly, the areas where I would assume a lot of people from in this room are based, the numbers are relatively relatively low, um, below five percent, going down to the southeast and York Peninsula and, and surrounding areas. There are zero to two point five percent. So. Not, not a massive amount of ownership, and that probably speaks to the, some of the longevity, particularly in the York Peninsula area of the farms that have been owned there. So just moving on. So we've had a look um, sort of top down, um, which is all very good. But the reality is then what are investors really looking for when they go out to, to uh, go and find, find an agricultural investment? They're really looking for companies that have low gearing. Um, if you've ever done anything or even gone through a GFC and been heavily geared, you'll understand the, the pain that high gearing can cause. Um, and also high gearing and cash flow, uh, when cash flow is tight, when things are bad, it's obviously very hard to, to look up, um, to manage and get through. Um, diversification around geographies, uh, farm management styles is very important um, and time horizons. Uh, when looking at agriculture, um, we invest in the share market and we say seven years. So I think I would hazard to guess that agriculture is at least a, a 10 year plus investment. Um, if, company, if a company is looking to put money into a market, you've got to be looking to create uh, economies of scale, um, optimising farm systems, uh, decreasing costs. We were talking about costs before in terms of gas, electricity. You can see a lot of uh, solar farms been popping up and Everyone's using solar these days to generate electricity, but also labour costs. Um, it, I was looking for a couple, a couple of things while I was doing this presentation, and Taylor Farms in the US, they've recently unveiled a fleet of robots that they, they use and has been able to decrease their, their work, uh, the numbers of workers that they have. Obviously, increasing yield. If you're going to take over a business, you're going to want yield to increase. Um, you've got to be able to do that. Uh, if you're not doing that, um, things are decreasing, you are likely overpaid for, your, for the business um, and making sure bottlenecks are removed. Where there are bottlenecks, if you think about what happened uh, over this year and you've probably seen it in the supermarkets, where blueberries blueberries used to be uh, really highly priced, there was a bit of a lot of supply came into the market. Um, you might have seen blueberries trading at $8 a punnet and all of a sudden they're, they're $2 a punnet and they can't get rid of these things. Um, that's sort of what happens in agriculture. When the commodity price is high, all the supply floods in. And then, um, then people start supplying, the price comes down as demand is met. So the last bit, and to try and, we've obviously rushed, uh, rushed through this pretty quickly because of time constraints, but um, just going on to our last chart here, We've tried to divide this up into listed spaces, primarily where, where we're focused. So I've got probably better knowledge of some of these companies. 
but we've tried to divide them up into primary companies that are the primary producers and the secondary companies which support those businesses. Also, there's uh, if, if you're looking to go and invest in, in the space, it's often hard to go and find some of these large investments. So uh, unlisted, uh, unlisted investments can help you. You can put money into funds and they go and fund your almond farms um, and the like. Um, also, there's a couple of different ones, uh, Duxton Asset Management, Rural Funds Management. There's a whole host of these businesses that go and take money, uh, and pull it with investors, they get the structures, and then they go out and invest in, in good projects. That was all I had. So, thanks very much.